Buenos días Facultad de Derecho, buenos días Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, buenos días México, buenos días donde quiera que nos esté escuchando, buenas tardes dependiendo del paralelo en que nos estén viendo. Eh, hoy nos encontramos aquí en la Universidad de Yale para entrevistar a uno de los más importantes constitucionalistas norteamericanos, profesor de esta universidad, que es el profesor Owen Fis. Welcome profesor Owen Fis. Thank you for Thank you. Uh, allow us to interview you. Thank you. Well, you are you have been working a lot of issues in, in your teaching career and your researching career and maybe one of the biggest topics you have worked is free speech. I, I will start by getting from you a definition what is free speech for you. Does free speech has limited or is unlimited, has to be controlled or not? <coughs> well, I, I see free speech as a constitutional protection uh, of democracy. Uh, that the purpose of protecting free speech uh, is to make sure we have a, a democratic system of governance. Uh, freedom of speech uh, is designed uh, to produce a debate uh, on issues of national importance that is in the terms of our Supreme Court Uh, robust, wide open, and uninhibited. And uh, uh, when we have this robust debate on issues of public importance, uh, I believe then we are achieving the purposes of freedom of speech. This freedom of speech, as I asked you before, has to be limited. I mean, people can go as far as they want in going or reclaiming, claiming from a robust debate is, has to be unlimited or is limited, the, this right? Well, I do believe that freedom of speech necessarily implies some limits on it. I don't think there's any, uh, any conception of freedom of speech that doesn't have a recognition of some limits. Um, But all those limits have to, have to be examined to see whether they enhance public debate or restrict public debate. Uh, and that strikes me as the essential criterion of deciding whether limitation uh, is uh, acceptable. Sometimes the threat to freedom of speech comes from the state Uh, the policeman uh, is arrest someone who is uh, making a speech criticizing the government. But one of the special themes of my work is that that threat to freedom of speech comes not just from the state, but also from private aggregations of power. In, in, you have wrote a book lately named The Irony of Free Speech. In this book, you you claim that there is a conflict of uh, between the first and the fourteenth warranty in, in the United States. How can we resolve this conflict of norms that you find out? Um, the first thing we should uh, remember is that the conflict that you're referring to is not just a conflict between the First Amendment and the 14th Amendment between free speech and the protection of equality, we have to recognize also that there's a conflict within free speech 
that is to say, if we give these private aggregations of power uh, unlimited reign, they will not enhance freedom of speech as I understand it, uh, but also act as a censor. Uh, they will curb the freedom of speech in the sense that they will limit public debate. Uh, and so I don't have a clear, I, I, I don't have a clear formulated to decide which restrictions are legitimate and which ones are uh, uh, illegitimate. But I want to say that it's not just a conflict between the First Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment, not just between liberty and equality, but the conflict is, is within uh, the First Amendment, within the guarantee of freedom of speech. You wrote an essay, a very interesting essay, named Adjudication, early, late in the late 1970s. And in this essay, you say, you look adjudication as, let me put it this way, more positive way than the critical studies. You say that adjudication can be good because in this way the judge can help uh, the, the sure. people. Sure. Do you still feel the same? Yes. I mean, increasingly in the United States, we have decisions by judges on the Supreme Court, for example, that I think are mistakes. Uh, I, I don't, when I say turn to adjudication, I don't guarantee that we'll always be free of errors. But what I was doing, one essay that I wrote called Against Settlement, is comparing the, what a judge could do as opposed to what would happen uh, if two parties just bargain and negotiate. And my theory is that whatever mistakes the judge makes, the judge will get us closer to what justice is than simply the negotiation or bargaining between the two parties. In the United States, starting in the light, late 70s and early 80s, there has been increasing emphasis upon something called alternative dispute resolution. And the underlying notion there is that we should stay away from the courts, we should negotiate, mediate, arbitrate, bargain as a way of uh, resolving our disputes. And as you intimated by your question, I say, well, that might help in the resolution of the dispute and produce peace, but the aspiration of law is not peace, but justice. And if we're talking about justice, I see the judge as a public official, uh, a representative of the state, being able to bring us closer to justice than the simple negotiation between the two parties. In your work, you have been very close to America, to Latin America. You have been in Argentina, has been in Mexico. And I guess I have to ask this question in order to make clear this concept of adjudication. Do you think that the judge can get to understand or interpret the public values? Uh, I put it in this way, in, in the United States it's a very multicultural state, uh, state. People from all over the world is here. And how the judge can know these public values or how can we determine these public values? Well. I don't, I don't purport to speak for Mexico or all of Latin America. Uh, and I know some portions of Latin America, like Argentina or Chile, or even before that, uh, uh, Brazil, had a very unfortunate experience that they were ruled by dic brutal dictatorships. Um, but at this point in history, uh, those countries that I mentioned have returned to a kind of democratic regime and perhaps not that different than Mexico is today. Um, um, I, I don't, I mean, lots of people from Latin America think that there's something dysfunctional about their judiciary and not able to, to articulate these public values but I don't see anything more dysfunctional 
in the Latin American judiciary than from the United States judges. When I speak about public values, for example, we talked just a moment ago about free speech. I was talking about understanding what freedom of speech entails in the United States, and that value is enhanced or encapsulated in the Constitution. But I'm sure in Mexico, Argentina, Chile, Brazil, they have constitutions also that are attached to this value, uh, and they're capable of articulating the meaning in much the same way as judges in the United States. Uh, I, I don't think the judges in the United States have a kind of monopoly on the interpretive power that comes from um, the, that they have enjoyed uh, over the years. In your work, I mean, I I think the this look the I view judges in the United States as not really people with moral expertise. I mean, they're not different than politicians or high business people in terms of their knowledge of these public values. I think what's distinctive in the United States that gives them the authority to articulate, interpret these public values in the Constitution is that they're limited by a certain procedure. They have to hear all the parties, they have to have trials in open court, uh, they have to announce publicly their decision, they have to give uh, 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 reasons and principles to support the decision, uh, and they have to remain insulated from political agencies. Uh, I think that's true of the United States and is a source of authority of the United States, but I think it's also true in Mexico, and I think it's also true in other parts of, of Latin America. I don't know what's happening at this moment in Ecuador, Venezuela, or Bolivia, but in so far we're talking about Mexico, Argentina, or Chile, uh, I, I think they have a, a functioning judiciary that has the same authority as American, uh, United States judges to elaborate on the meaning of these values. You are a member of the CELA uh, committee, the uh, uh, Seminario de Latinoamérica de Teoría sí. Constitucional y Política for several years. 20 years. Uh, yes. Have you seen progress in the law in America? The law has progress for good or for bad? Where do you see us in these 20 years? Well, we've been in existence 20 years. We, the first meeting was held in the summer of 1995. Uh, my first experience, in, real experience in Latin America was in 1985 when I went to Argentina with a small group of, of other philosophers and lawyers uh, to work on the transition to democracy occurring there. So my, my perspective dates not just to 1995, uh, but also has, reaches back even before that uh, to 1985. And I would say that the most remarkable thing to me is that over these 20 years, or over these uh, 30 years, regardless of whether you take 1995, 1985 as your benchmark, I think there's been a remarkable convergence uh, in the methodology and perspective uh, of academic lawyers in the United States at Yale and the lawyers who participate uh, from uh, uh, Mexico or other Latin American countries. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight, uh, but uh, I, I think there is a remarkable convergence about how and what we think about law. I would say the critical the, the distinguishing factor uh, of, of American academic law is its critical perspective on the work of the judiciary. I mean, we analyze, uh, we describe, but we always remain a certain distance uh, from it to see if that measures up to uh, justice. We, we reject any dogmatic conception that this is justice. Uh, and I would say that that, um, that perspective uh, is uh, increasingly manifest in the work of, of Selah. Some of our people, like uh, Jose uh, Ramon 
Cosillo was a member of Sela uh, when he was the dean of Itam. Uh, and there are a great number of uh, lawyers and political scientists from Mexico who are in our group. And uh, I, I do see a convergence, and not quite the same. You have different starting points. The fact that you're a civil law country, uh, the code induces a certain perspective on, on law. Uh, but I, I think it's getting closer uh, that, uh, over these last 20 or 30 years. I was reading a few weeks ago the latest book of Ruth Sackerman, We the People, number three, right. in which he talks about the civil rights in the 1960s. And I guess it's a, for me, it will be a very beautiful detail that he dedicated the book for you. And I, I guess he's right in dedicating to you because you were a, a special actor during those times. Uh, How do you see the civil rights movements from the 60s to today in America, in the United States? Where do you have to go? Where do you have to move? What do, do, do you need to do to transform and go to a very most equal society? Because I remember you wrote a book, uh, A Way Out from the Ghettos, and you were worried about the people, the black colored people. So, what has been changing here in the United States and what's not is changing here? Well, that's a very good question and a very deep question and uh, I'm a little unclear about the answer. Uh, in November 2008, uh, the United States elected a black man as president of the United States. This was a transcendent event in the history of the United States that began, as you know, with slavery based uh, on race. And my work in the 60s in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice was very much concerned with uh, employment discrimination, school segregation, uh, discrimination in public accommodations, Uh, and also with election discrimination so that blacks were not were completely disenfranchised in some of the uh, some of the states now from that perspective I couldn't have foreseen that in the year 2008 we would have a black man elected president of the United States and I, I think I, I think that's a remarkable achievement Uh, I would say, speaking more generally, uh, over the last 40 or 50 years, uh, we have made a tremendous progress in creating what I call a black middle class. So you, you look at, for example, the mayor of New York, who's white, but you look at his cabinet, it's, it's just incredible uh, to find people of color in that cabinet at the level. So I, I think, I think It's a remarkable achievement, uh, uh, what we've accomplished. On the other hand, as you uh, mentioned in this book, A Way Out, uh, I also think that what has happened is not a moment to stop. Uh, that at, although we have created a black middle class, uh, although we've had a president uh, of the United States who is black, we still have what I call the black underclass that still exists and needs our attention. The black underclass consists of people who are black, uh, but also people who are unemployed or live at levels of economic deprivation that makes them still a pariah in American society. And I think, although I want to ce celebrate the progress, I still, as I do in this book, A Way Out, I'm still deeply concerned about the plight of those who've been left behind. Uh, and that is the class of, uh, of the black uh, underclass. This class seems to be growing. This, ca this class seems to be growing more entrenched. Uh, the inequalities uh, that are we characterize in America also 
as they get higher, the blacks, unemployed, uh, neighborhoods, living in neighborhoods that are still uh, riddled with crime, uh, no manufacturing jobs for any of them. Uh, I, I think it's, it's just getting worse. The other thing, I, I don't mean to go on indefinitely, but in the 60s, uh, in the early 60s, we were primarily, not exclusively, but primarily focusing on blacks and their exclusion from American society. They, they were the pariah underclass of our society. And we adopted a lot of strategies to improve their situation. Um, but today, uh, I think the cause of civil rights has many dimensions to it. It's not just concern with the blacks. Uh, over the years, it's been concerned, growing increasing concern with the plight of women, uh, with the, and it's following that, the plight of the uh, LGBT community, gay and lesbian, bisexual and transgender, transgender movement, uh, and we've been concerned with those rights. Uh, at the same time, we're concerned, increasing concern, with the Hispanic community in the United States. I don't think any of these groups had the disabilities that blacks had uh, in the 60s, but they have plenty of disabilities, and that civil rights today uh, is understood uh, as embracing their interest as well as the black. And at this very moment, uh, I think Americans are becoming increasingly concerned, as they were in the mid-60s, with the, the poor. Uh, this book pub published by uh, Thomas Piketty, uh, these uh, demonstrations by Occupy Wall Street uh, are calling attention to the growth of uh, tremendous inequalities, economic inequalities in America, which need our attention. So the answer to your question is that I think we've made tremendous progress uh, on the issue of blacks, uh, but that a lot has to be done on the issue of the black underclass. And on top of that, I think we need to pay attention to the needs uh, of these other groups, the poor, uh, ethnic minorities, uh, gay, lesbian community, uh, and the situation of women. It's, it's good that you point out to the Hispanic community, and I guess I cannot avoid this question for you as a constitutional professor and, and defender of the uh, civil rights. What is your position, what is your point of view about the migrant kids? The problem of the migrant kids coming to the United States. What should we do with this problem? Because there is an enormous kind of, uh, number of kids that are crossing the border, and I, I was watching the TVs uh, late on, like uh, early this week, and I saw a, a person from the government that said that these kids were crossing because they told them that they can have their concessions for get the nationality, which is a joke. They right. they, they don't cross for it; they cross for other reasons. So, right. what? What is the answer to stop this problem that is growing? Well, uh, in the 18, uh, 1980s, uh, Texas passed a law which denied uh, children of so, this is the phrase they use, illegal immigrants from, and who are themselves illegal immigrants, from going to public schools. And in a famous decision uh, by the Supreme Court in a case called Plyla versus Doe, the Supreme Court said that this was an inappropriate response to these children. And that whatever you do, you can't adopt policies that transform these migrant children into a new pariah class. Uh, and uh, I thoroughly agree with that decision and would say that that's the key to understand of what you can do. You can, perhaps you could stop them at the border, 
But if these children come into the United States, they have, should be treated as members of our community and given the full benefits of what it means to be a member of our community. They cannot be denied education, and they shouldn't be denied the opportunity uh, to work, or they shouldn't be denied the benefits that come from the welfare system, like food stamps or health care. Uh, they are part of our community, uh, and they should be accepted as members of our community. Well, uh, to end this interview, which I have enjoyed a lot, what is what are you working now? What are what is next in your work? What should we expect? Well, um, when I first went to Latin America uh, in uh, 1985 to Argentina, uh, I went down there. Uh, thinking that we in the United States uh, had a lot to impart to people in Argentina or the rest of Latin America. Uh, I thought I was riding on a white horse, uh, bringing uh, our learnings and our achievements. Uh, I would say increasingly, uh, but after 2001, uh, and Je President Bush's declaration of the war on terror, uh, I think the people in Latin America, the other members of CELA, uh, have been holding up a mirror to us and asking whether our law is as noble and as good as we pretend. And starting uh, in 2003, uh, and continuing to this day, uh, I have been focusing on the war on terror uh, that was announced by President Bush uh, and unfortunately continued by President Obama for the last decade. And I, over this 10-year period, 12-year period continuing to today, I have been mainly uh, examining the counter-terrorism policies uh, of the two administrations and try to understand uh, how these policies uh, affect our Constitution. Uh, and I've been sort of publishing articles and books uh, that uh, have been very critical uh, of uh, the, the, the critical of these policies, not from an international law point, but from our own Constitution that there's transgressions of certain uh, principles that are sacred to our Constitution that have been trampled uh, over the last decade. Uh, we've, you know, imprisoned people without offering them an opportunity for trial. Uh, we have used military commissions to try some of them. Uh, we have uh, um, denied some uh, habeas corpus. Uh, we have engaged in warrantless wiretapping, uh, and uh, most recently, during, particularly during Obama's administration, with other traces before, we have engaged in targeted killing of suspected uh, uh, terrorists. And all of these policies uh, may be justified in terms of pragmatic necessity, uh, but I think they betray certain fundamental constitutional principles of the United States. And that's what I have been working on for the last decade. By using this answer, uh, many constitutional theories nowadays in America, in the United States, say that the presidential figure, the institution of the presidency, has too many powers. That they have to control it. Do you feel the same? Um, I think a lot of people uh, feel that way. And a lot of people criticize the Bush administration on uh, what's called unilateralism, acting on his own without the concurrence of Congress or the court. But my feeling is I don't know 
um, I, I don't know how profound a criticism that is, uh, because what, what's remarkable is that Congress has acquiesced in at least the counterterrorism, acquiesced in the policies uh, of the Bush administration and in the Obama administration. Uh, Congress has been very tough on President Obama, uh, particularly in areas like uh, uh, health care, uh, tax policy, job creation. Uh, but in the area that I know best, namely um, the counterterrorism, Congress has been very uh, uh, agreeable and acquiescing in this thing. And I feel also that the Supreme Court has been deferring to the president as well. And although there are some decisions that the Supreme Court has made that curb the power of the president, uh, these are exceptions and very limited uh, uh, exercises by the courts. So maybe the president has increased his power, but always with the approval of Congress and the willingness of the Supreme Court to close its eyes to what's happening before. I must say that I, I first read your, your work because Professor Gargarella, oh. uh, he used to talk and write a lot about you. And most, so much writing about you made me read your work. And as I told you when I uh, knew you, that most of your work, uh, you have work in Spanish, but it's hard to find out. Still, you can try the persons in Mexico City and in America to find out about the books you have written in Spanish. I don't know if you can tell them about those books so they can find it. Well, um, uh, one book uh, that I've written uh, is on my theories of free speech, uh, which has been published in Spanish. One is the irony of free speech, another one is free speech and social structure, uh, and uh, a third one is called Democracy and Dissent, which was edited by Professor Gargarella. Uh, all of these are in Spanish. Uh, my work on the one subject that we talked about, uh, namely adjudication and procedure, uh, has been published in Spanish. A publisher in Spain uh, published it, uh, and it's called uh, the um, the law as public reason, uh, and that was published in Spain and should be available, uh, and it includes most of my articles on uh, on adjudication, uh, structural reform, and most recently I published a book. Uh, based on my work on law and human rights uh, and that was also published in Spain uh, and in, uh, in, in the English title is The Dictates of, uh, uh, of uh, Justice and that deals mainly with the issues of human rights both in Argentina and the United States uh, it, it sort of half is the United States problem and half uh, Argentina. Well, Professor, it has been a real pleasure to talk with you. I guess that it's hard to understand the civil rights movements without reading your work. It's very valuable. Hopefully, the people in in America and in Mexico will read it. It has been a pleasure, Professor. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Nice Thank to meet you.
as a constitutional protection uh, of democracy. Uh, that the purpose of protecting free speech uh, is to make sure we have a, a democratic system of governance. Uh, freedom of speech uh, is designed uh, to produce a debate uh, on issues of national importance that is, in the terms of our Supreme Court, uh, robust, wide open, and uninhibited. And uh, uh, when we have this robust debate on issues of public importance, uh, I believe then we are achieving the purposes of freedom of speech. This freedom of speech, as I asked you before, has to be limited. I mean, people can go as far as they want in going or reclaiming, claiming from a robust debate. It has to be unlimited or is limited, the, this right? Well, I do believe that freedom of speech necessarily implies some limits on it. I don't think there's any uh, any conception of freedom of speech that doesn't have a recognition of some limits. Um, but all those limits have to have to be examined to see whether they enhance public debate or restrict public debate. Uh, and that strikes me as the essential criterion of deciding whether limitation uh, oh, en México, buenos días México buenos días donde quiera que nos esté escuchando buenas tardes dependiendo del paralelo en que nos estén viendo eh, hoy nos encontramos aquí en la Universidad de Yale para entrevistar a uno de los más importantes constitucionalistas norteamericanos profesor de esta universidad que es el profesor Owen Fiss welcome profesor Owen Fiss thank you for thank you. Uh, allow us to interview you thank you well you are you have been working a lot of issues in, in your teaching career and your researching career and maybe one of the biggest topics you have worked is free speech. Uh, I, I will start by getting from you a definition what is free speech for you? Does free speech has limited or is unlimited? Has to be controlled or not? <coughs> well, uh, I, I see free speech Buenos días, Facultad de Derecho. Buenos días, Universidad Nacional Autónoma. Is uh, acceptable. Sometimes the threat to freedom of speech comes from the state. Uh, the policeman uh, is arrests someone who is uh, making a speech criticizing the government. But one of the special themes of my work is that that threat to freedom of speech comes not just from the state but also from private aggregations of power. In, in, you have wrote a book lately named The Irony of Free Speech. In this book you, you claim that there is a conflict of, uh, between the first and the 14th warranty in, in the United States. How can we resolve this conflict of norms that you find out? Um, 